This is a brief tutorial on how to estimate sample size for Module 1. I will use the example study on chocolate intake and depression for this tutorial. As a reminder, we are estimating sample size for a cross-sectional study. Our outcome variable will be depression, yes or no. Our primary predictor variable will be chocolate high intake versus low intake. Both of these variables have just two levels, therefore both are considered dichotomous. In your text, Table 6.1 tells you that the chi-square test is the appropriate simple statistical test to use to estimate sample size when you have both, both dichotomous predictor and outcome variables. Table 6b2 in your text is one possible way to estimate sample size for chi-square tests, but it only works if your exposed and unexposed populations are of the same size. Therefore, we need to find another way to estimate sample sizes. One possible approach is to use the Rust Length Free app that I've got a link for here on this page. There are many other choices out on the internet that you can use. In this class, I will use this one. This is what you will see when you click on the link provided on the other page. Right now, you should choose Test Comparing Two Proportions, which I have highlighted here. This is what you will see first when you open it up. Note that it has P1, P2, N1, N2, and power here at the bottom. Also note that there is a checkbox for equal Ns. Be sure to uncheck that box before you start. And a quick tip, this little box here, which is grayed, rather than sliding this number back and forth, this, this bar back and forth, if you click on the little gray box, it will open up a box that you can actually type your numbers in. It makes it much easier. By the way, I always leave alpha at 0.05 and I leave the continuity co correction box checked. So, what is P1 and P2? P1 is the proportion of the exposed population with disease. P2 is the proportion of the unexposed population with the disease. But here's your first problem. If you knew what P1 and P2 were, you wouldn't have to do your study. So, how do you get these numbers to estimate your sample size? One possible way to estimate these numbers is to look in the scientific literature for studies that are similar to yours. Can you find a study that estimates the proportion of the unexposed population that has the outcome? If so, this is a good estimate of P2 for your study. Sometimes, however, all you can find is the proportion of the entire population that has the outcome. This is a good range to start with your estimates in the unexposed population, recognizing, of course, that it's a mixture of both exposed and unexposed. Therefore, you need to consider how you should modify it, either up or down. Then, decide, based upon your experience, what would be the smallest difference between P1 and P2 that would still be meaningful? For example, if the rate of depression in Olmsted County is 10%, would you really care if chocolate consumption decreased at 0.095? Likely not. Plus, getting a P less than 0.05 for a difference that small would take a very, very large study. So, don't set P1 to 0.095 better to set it to something like 0.07 or 0.05. Basically, you want to pick the smallest difference that's meaningful and begin your calculations with those numbers. Another possible way to estimate these numbers is to conduct a pilot study. What was the rate of exposure in the unexposed population in your pilot study? This is a defensible estimate of P2. However, recognize that Pilot studies are small by definition, therefore the estimate may be quite poor. An interesting article on this topic is Kramer et al. from a 2006 issue of, in the Archives of General Psychiatry. You could also estimate P1 from the pilot study, or you could again choose, based upon your experience, the smallest difference between P1 and P2 that would still be meaningful. Again. Pick the smallest difference that is meaningful and start your calculations there. See if the numbers that you come up with 
make sense and yield um, a good estimate and a reasonable size study. So let's start plugging in numbers into the app. As we said before, we estimate that P1 was 0.07, so I type that in there. We estimated that population 2, P2, is 0 0.10, so I put that in there, this box. Then what to put in N1? I just start with a big number, I guess, and say 10,000 people. I found an earlier estimate that 35% of the population at Olmsted were regular consumers of chocolate. I used 0.35 times 10,000 to estimate N1 to be 3,500 and put that over here. That leaves a difference of 6,500 left to be in N2. Notice I've already unchecked equal ends here, otherwise these numbers would pop back and forth to match each other. When I hit enter after that, up pops a power of 0.9992. I only need to have 80% power. This is higher than I need, I need to have. So I can decrease my sample size and try to get a smaller size study that's more reasonable to conduct. So let's go lower. Let's try 5,000. 0 0.07 and 0.1 stay in P1 and P2. This time I take 5,000 times 0.35 and I get 17.05 for N1 and the difference is 32.95. Type that in there. Now we get a power of 0 0.9427, actually. Again, remember our goal is 80%, so this is still too high. We can still go smaller. I did this a number of times and finally got down to an estimate of 3,200. 3,200 times 0.35 is 1120, that's N1. The difference is 2080, that's N2. That yields a power estimate of 0.8028. That's close enough to 80% and I'll just stop there. Before you finalize your sample size, you should first understand that the final prevalence ratio in your study is equal to P1 divided by P2. This is the prevalence ratio closest to 1 that you will be able to detect in your study. If your exposure increases risk of the outcome, it would have a prevalence ratio of 1 or greater. Then this is the prevalence ratio that's the smallest one or closest to 1 that will have a p-value of less than 0.05. Any prevalence ratio closer to 1 will not be statistically significant. If your exposure decreases risk of the outcome, it would have a prevalence ratio of less than 1. Then it's the largest prevalence ratio that would have a p-value of less than or equal to 0.05. Any prevalence ratio closer to 1 would have a p-value of greater than 0.05 and would not be considered statistically significant. For example, in our earlier calculations, our exposure was protective. Therefore, our prevalence ratio estimate was less than 1. Specifically, it was 0.7. In this example, this is the least extreme prevalence ratio, close compared to 1, that would also have a p-value of less than or equal to 0.05. Anything larger than that in this area would not have a p-value of less than 0.05. It would be greater than that. So for example, if your study yielded an estimate of 0.75, the p-value would be greater than 0.05. Let's look at it in the other way. If our exposure was a risk factor, the prevalence ratio estimate would be greater than 1. Let's look at an example. Let's flip P1 and P2 and have the estimate be 1.43, which is the inverse of 0.7. This is the least extreme prevalence ratio that you would be able to detect in your study. Anything smaller than that would have a p-value of greater than 0.05. For example, if your study yielded an estimate of 1.4, just a bit closer to 1, the p-value would be greater than 0.05 and the estimate would not be statistically significant. Think about whether this is acceptable to you. In other words, if your study yielded an effect estimate of 
would you believe this to be clinically significant and also want it to be statistically significant? If so, then you would need to re-estimate your sample size now so that your study would find 1.4 to be statistically significant. To do this, solve for P2 and then recalculate N1 and N2 so that the power is 80 percent. In this example, we would have to increase our sample size total to 3550 in order to get an estimate of power of 80 percent. One last thing, for this class, please do not propose an estimate of effect like a relative risk or prevalence ratio of less than 0.4 or greater than 2.5 unless you also defend it. Tell me why you believe that's reasonable to expect such an extreme effect estimate in your study. I would need you to provide some evidence from the scientific literature to suggest that such a strong association is reasonable. Most of the time, studies today do not yield very strong estimates of effect. If you cannot defend your estimate of effect being less than 0.4 or greater than 2.5, then change your P1 and P2 values so that your estimate falls between these two values. Thank you for watching this tutorial on how to estimate sample size for a cross-sectional study using a chi-square test. Please continue on with the next tutorial on how to estimate sample size and power if you have a continuous predictor variable.